Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar on responding to cyber incidents affecting operational technology. I've been really looking forward to this session for a couple of reasons. First, cyber threats to operational technology are significant and growing. They already present very significant legal risks to companies that own, operate, manufacture, or distribute operational technology. We at Mayor Brown have been working closely with companies across sectors, and we're looking forward to sharing our perspectives on a topic that is only going to grow in importance for companies and their in-house counsel. Second, we're really excited to be joined today by Dragos so that we can discuss this important topic from a legal and technical perspective. If you followed this space, then I'm sure you'll be aware of Dragos's position as a leader in the field of OT cybersecurity, including its response. And if you haven't, I'm confident you'll leave today's session with a clear sense of their expertise in this space. My name is Stephen Lilly, and I'm a partner in our cybersecurity and data privacy practice based in DC. In that role, I advise a wide range of companies are preparing for and responding to cyber incidents, as well as high profile vulnerability disclosures, and also re represent companies in associated litigation. My practice increasingly focuses on connected products like cars and medical devices, and the operational technology we're discussing today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to work with our clients on this important topic because cybersecurity in the operational technology that runs our critical infrastructure was the first and frankly most important cybersecurity policy issue that I worked on while serving as a lawyer in the Senate about 10 years ago. I'm joined today by my colleague Veronica Glick, who is a senior associate in our cybersecurity and data privacy practice and who also regularly works on cybersecurity incident response and operational technology questions. Veronica also has been serving recently as the Deputy Chief Counsel, Chief Counsel for Cybersecurity and National Security to the Cyber Solarium Commission, so has been closely involved in ongoing policy debates about the security of operational technology. We are joined today by Jason Christopher, who is Dragos' Principal Cyber Risk Advisor. In addition to his work at Dragos, Jason has a wealth of experience in operational technology security in both the private sector and in government. He previously served as Chief Technology Officer at Axio, as well as playing key roles within the Department of Energy, including managing its response capabilities and serving as the sector lead for the cybersecurity framework that I'm sure many of your companies use. Jason, thanks very much for being with us today. Before we start, perhaps you could give us a little bit more background on Dragos and also how you came to work on these issues. Excellent, thank you, Stephen. Yeah, so my name is Jason Christopher, um, and as the Principal Cyber Risk Advisor at Dragos, what we really do is focus on industrial risks, meaning critical infrastructure, uh, the things that at the end of the day, when we think of overall society and uh, civilization, we have these backbones like power, energy, water, and those are the systems that we are most passionate about in protecting. Uh, they are operated differently. They use a different skill set to be able to manage sort of these um, industrial processes. And pulling those things together requires an additional flavor of cybersecurity. And that's what we really focus on as an industrial cybersecurity firm, which is going to be, again, different than what you may see in traditional what we'd call information technology systems. For myself, I actually started off as an asset owner or operator. Uh, the way that we would go about in the utility business of installing these systems is where I started. And then one day I just asked somebody, who takes care of cybersecurity? Uh, I found out that I really wasn't uh, too thrilled with uh, sort of the response on that characteristic because we didn't really have the same amount of rigor or standards and policies uh, 15 years ago in this as we did in the information technology space. And so that's what really spurred my career into this, leading off from where I was an asset owner to then becoming a federal regulator and ultimately uh, leading federal programs as you described, Stephen. So I'm very excited to be here today to be able to sort of share that perspective across all those different roles with the audience. Fantastic, thanks, Jason. So as Jason mentioned, we're talking about operational technology or OT today. Um, you may have heard various other buzzwords that are used or phrases that are used. So you might've heard about the industrial internet of things, industrial control systems, SCADA systems. Now, really, whatever terms you use, what we're talking about today are the systems, as Jason said, sit at the backbone of our modern way of life. Now, we have here the definition from NIST. Um, these are systems that control physical devices, processes, and events in the enterprise. So think of systems that sit at the heart of the electric grid or that run nuclear power plants or that operate manufacturing facilities or oil rigs. In other words, as Jason pointed out, we're stepping outside the realm of traditional information technology, and we're focusing on systems that control machines at various levels of complexity. 
Jason, is there anything else you know, before we sort of dive into the, um, you know, the substance of, of instant response, anything else to, to help people understand the context here of the technologies we're talking about today? Um, is there a way to sort of help visualize you know, what, these, what these look like, where they sit, um, and how they're becoming increasingly connected over time? Absolutely. So when we think about data and when we pass zeros and ones, uh, the zeros and ones in traditional sort of information technology would be the information itself. Within OT, though, those zeros and ones will actually move something in the physical world. It may open a valve or a switch or a lever uh, that actually has a physical process to it. So we're either manufacturing something uh, or we're processing uh, some industrial overall use of something, uh, very similar to how you'd use a thermostat in your house, only on an industrial scale. So a thermostat, for example, takes a sensor reading uh, from your room temperature, uh, and then you give it an input, what you want the temperature to be. And it'll actually turn on either your air conditioner or your heater to be able to get to that temperature. And once you get the feedback loop, that is the zeros and ones communicating back and forth. If you just imagine those on sort of the industrial scale with these motors and turbines and giant engines, that's what we're talking about when we ultimately think of operational technology for industrial sector. And we have a, a pretty complex history when we think through it. Uh, you can see here, this was sort of how we view things from the third industrial revolution where we first started having automation for production in place. And we started to then figure out that there was more engineers could do if they had visibility into the process, if they could start controlling things on an automation scale uh, with feedback loops and having actual machine interfaces that they can communicate with. And then you see today, we're seeing a highly connected organization here. We started seeing uh, either connectivity from a wired machine to machine perspective or even interactive remote access where an operator can, from the comfort of their home in some cases, uh, actually see visible things inside that process. And we start seeing this more connectivity get added over time. That also, unfortunately, from a cybersecurity perspective, also introduces more attack vectors. The more information you have out there, the more inputs you have out there, uh, the more capabilities you then have for attackers to be able to take those into consideration. And I don't know, uh, Veronica, if there's an, any other piece here that you see from sort of a uh, legal uh, perspective as well, so that those risks or, or some of the trade-offs that, that come with uh, these new technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I would just add that from our view, we've also seen some of these exciting opportunities that digitalization is providing to our clients. So our tech transaction team in particular have seen clients in chemical and other industries um, scale and enhance products by leveraging these new machine learning technologies. So although we're, we're going to jump into some of these notable cybersecurity risks from connectivity, we also uh, point we want to make here is that we don't want to lose sight of these opportunities for the industry. Excellent. And one of the things that Stephen actually led off with was a conversation from NIST, uh, the Na National Institute of Standards and Technology. There are a lot of great sort of guidelines out there that have a conversation about what you should do to secure these things. And I, I know that you can see sort of on that left-hand side a little bit of an eye chart, but there's a clear distinction between OT and IT. Uh, this is from Special Publication 882. Uh, you can Google that. It is a Googleable document. It's open and accessible for everybody, and it provides requirements overall on what type of strategies you may want to have in place. At the end of the day, I think that some of the key points or key distinctions that you can take away from OT versus IT beyond the uh, zero or a one will control something in the physical world is sort of how are these things operated? Uh, you can see here, they are 24 by 7 operations. They must always be available. When you turn on your light switch, you want the power to turn on. Also, many of these devices have a life cycle measured in decades, not years. Uh, so if you could think about having a phone or a laptop on the order of 30 years, and how would you secure that thing? Now you're starting to think about the complexity about the environments that we have within the OT space. We need to make sure that these things are not only available when we need them to be, but they're also reliable and resilient. Some of these devices, for example, when we talk about the nation's grid, are on a pole in some place remote that an operator would actually have to somehow manage, not only from a security perspective, but also just from the overall reliability perspective to make sure that thing is functional and operational uh, on this overall life cycle. 
Uh, and so, Stephen, I don't know whether or not this sort of uh, differences in OT or IT have been something that you've seen with your clients or sort of uh, other additional legal concerns that maybe we can draw a thread from for this. Yeah, I mean, certainly one of the big themes I'd want to leave with our clients with from a legal perspective is that the differences in technology have significant implications in our perspective um, on how a company and a legal department is going to be organized to respond to those issues. So oftentimes we see a cybersecurity uh, team um, having a privacy focus or coming out of a privacy function, and it doesn't necessarily, um, you know, the responsibilities of a, of a related to privacy are not necessarily the same that relate to OT. OT, as you said, Jason, is about availability and raises safety issues um, that aren't really in play from the privacy side that you handle from a normal data breach. And our experience, um, and I'd be interested, Jason, if, you, if it's the same, is that really you need to think about having a different IR plan, a different IR team with different stakeholders, and things like different tabletops. And that's, I think, something we'll be talking about throughout this presentation is that taking the model, you know, you shouldn't necessarily assume that because you have a good data breach response plan, your position to respond to OT incidents. Absolutely, Stephen. I 1,000% I agree with that. When you think about the incident response, from a data breach perspective, that may be entirely insulated into your corporate IT department. But when we think about what may happen during an OT breach, uh, when you actually have a equipment failure, it may look and feel a lot more like a maintenance event, which means you need to have your engineers ready to be able to help identify what you need to respond and recover from that, which would be less of an IT function and more of sort of that engineering expertise to allow you to, again, return to safe and reliable operations. Right. So with our time today, we plan to walk through some of the threats, legal risks, and practical takeaways that we have collectively learned as we've guided clients through cyber preparedness and incidents. So over this presentation, we'll provide an overview of cyber threats that are specific to OT, some of the legal risks associated with cyber incidents affecting OT that can be helpful to keep in mind, legal counsel's role in responding effectively to these incidents. And then finally, we'll discuss a few fundamental ways that counsel can prepare for OT incidents before they occur. So although these are complicated issues, the good news is that your engagement as counsel can significantly reduce legal risk, whatever your business's risk profile. And today, we hope to provide some practical and actionable guidance that will help you do that. And for the audience, um, you should feel free to submit any questions that you have through the Q&A window on the left of your screen. We'll try our best um, as we can to address those at the end of the presentation. And so from our view, one of the key and initial steps to understanding the threat landscape that your company faces is understanding the types of cyber attacks that the industry faces more broadly. Um, the key issue to note here um, for OT, as, as Jason and Stephen mentioned, is that this is different from traditional data breaches. When we think of OT, we're often talking about impacts in the physical world. And obviously, depending on the technology, the risks are going to vary. Um, and we look forward to hearing uh, Jason's perspective on this. But from our view, the main takeaway is that we are talking about a present and growing threat to the technologies that are at the backbone of our way of life. And so Jason, I know you and your colleagues have thought deeply about the threats facing OT, and it would be great to hear a little bit more about your insights on the trends and risks in this area. Thanks, Veronica. Absolutely. So one of the things that we do at Dragos is we actually track adversary groups, uh, these activity groups that are focusing primarily on industrial control systems. Again, even in the case of cybersecurity, when we think about overall threats, there are certain additional capabilities you need to be able to say that you're targeting industrial control systems because these things are very unique compared to what you'd see in normal data centers uh, or how you'd attack somebody within a corporate IT environment, you have to have a lot more independent knowledge on the protocols that are being used, the way that the systems can be leveraged to, again, have that sort of uh, physical impact that you'd expect to see from an ICS-based attack. So this is from our, our 2019 threat assessment. Um, we release every year a conversation not only about the threats that we see, uh, but also the vulnerabilities that are out there just for industrial control systems and how we see uh, defenders, the actual folks who are operating, react and respond and improve their cybersecurity posture over time. So those reports are freely available uh, on our website. And you can see here in 2019, we started seeing some additional activity that we weren't seeing before. We now have an additional uh, three activity groups uh, that we now have 11 total that are just uh, nation states or others that have the capability 
to go into industrial control systems. This led to additional sort of threat focus on not just what we see in ICS globally, but also within the United States and APAC. And now we're also seeing sort of what I'd call collateral damage from ransomware or other activities and events that you see in the news that may impact operations, but don't have sort of that laser focused uh, impact on physical uh, breakdown of equipment, things of that nature. So as we see sort of that, again, that initial um, conversation on more connectivity into these spaces and to industrial control systems that typically did not have connectivity, we now see an additional threat landscape and um, attack surface that we weren't seeing previously. And so as we sort of dive into that uh, just a little bit more, we now see a difference between what is most likely, but also what are the most severe impacts. And when we think about this from a threat perspective, the things to really note are really at the end of the day, how do you put together an ICS-based attack? Most of them start, as any good story does in cybersecurity, with a phishing attempt. Somebody clicking on a link that they shouldn't have, installing software that they shouldn't have. And next thing you know, that propagates into, at first, that IT network. That IT network is where a lot of actors are going to find uh, information about your organization, how operations are actually ran, uh, what equipment you may or may not have. And then to be able to see what that would look differently on the ICS side, the industrial control system, the operational technology, the OT side, is really where we start seeing, again, that degradation in operations itself, physical uh, equipment damage, really things that would be more aligned with property and casualty and less aligned with sort of data breaches. The attacks themselves are going to be very different in the way that they look and feel. And you can see here we even had in 2017 an attack that compromised actual safety equipment, which brings us into a whole new realm of additional considerations. One of the things that we all assume as engineers when we arrive on site to work with an operational technology system is that it's going to be safe and reliable. And if it's not reliable, at the very least, it fails safe so that I know as a responder that there may not be any additional harm uh, for health and human safety that may be impacted as a result of that. With attackers now focusing on those systems too, it sort of raises the stakes overall from what the impacts could be on that ICS side to something that's a little bit uh, more concerning. And I don't know, Veronica, if there's maybe another analogy or uh, other links that take this technical side and loop it back into uh, sort of legal terms or other considerations that you've seen as well. Right, and I'm sure it's apparent from what um, from this, what Jason has shared, and we'll discuss this shortly. But we are talking here about physical consequences, as you said, from these attacks that disrupt businesses and impact a broad range of products and services that we use every day. So for counsel, it's easy to see how each of these issues can give rise to legal repercussions from the physical consequences and injuries, mass tort, IP theft. And then on top of this, you can envision engagement with law enforcement and possibly um, the media and regulators. So overall, we'll come back to this, but the potential legal challenges are, are very broad. And when we think about the actual ICS attacks, the other thing to just note is unlike maybe some of the headlines that you've seen in the news, these things do require sort of specific knowledge to be able to execute. Uh, it's not a simply double click on a malware package and all of a sudden you can get into the ICS and shut down operations. It's nothing ever that simple. This isn't going to be the classic 1995 film, The Hackers, right? We're not going to see a virus singing, row, row, row your boat while it's capsizing things. It's just not that simple. It really will look and feel a lot more like a maintenance event. It'll look and feel like I don't have communications where I need to have them. Maybe there's something wrong with that modem. Maybe I need to go out to that remote site and see what's going on. And so this is actually from a white paper from SANS that sort of outlines what an ICS attack could look like in something that we call the ICS cybersecurity kill chain. But it also highlights sort of the overall difficulty when we think about how to successfully attack these systems. Compromising the border, the perimeter of these things is relatively simple. And because these devices, again, are decades old in some cases, you may actually find that there are a load of vulnerabilities that you could actually make it so you can compromise the security of those systems, maybe make something fail over. But to actually disrupt the industrial control system requires you to understand the process a little bit more. Maybe it requires you to also understand how manual operations would get involved. To actually have high confidence and what it is that you're going to do to actually have that impact. Again, you now need to combine things that are not just IT security or OT security, but also the protocols that are being used, the devices and systems that are there. 
the engineering processes. How disaster recovery may come into play. You can see it's extremely difficult, especially when we start talking about things that may have a successful reattack option. So just because you were compromised once and maybe there was a really bad day, could there be another bad day as a subsequent result? Well, it all depends on that sort of attacker space and what is it they understand overall. Because again, not just like an IT attack where there may be uh, simple toolkits and frameworks out there, there's a little bit more complexity when we talk about the ICS space. I don't know, Stephen, if this also sort of corresponds to things that you've seen, uh, especially with regard to overall complexity of attacks uh, and sort of that overall uh, legal significance that may be there as well. Yeah, definitely, Jason. I think in, in a way there's some, some good news, I think, on this slide, which is that you know, the nightmare scenario that everybody is, is thinking about, the sort of, you know, the, the scenario that would be the, you know, the, the basis for some sort of international thriller is that, that is a, you know, those types of attacks, like you said, are not sort of routine. It's not as if any, any 17 year old in a basement somewhere can, can bring down these systems. Um, I guess the one, you know, the one, the one touch of gray I'd add to the silver lining, I guess, is that, um, Unfortunately, any type of incident in this space is likely to have pretty significant legal consequences. So, um, you know, think about a scenario. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe nothing really bad happens, but you find out that attackers have gone into your networks, and then you have questions about what exactly was affected, and you may not be able to determine exactly what was compromised, um, and you may have third parties who are asking for certainty. You can certainly imagine, as, a, as the in-house counsel, um, you know, no one got hurt, but you, you can certainly imagine filling your day, your days and months probably for some fair amount of time, um, working through all the different legal ramifications. So I think there is good news in that, you know, the, the, sort of the worst case scenario is not um, you know, necessarily going to be realized on a mass scale, you know, regularly. Uh, but unfortunately, from a, from a legal risk perspective, even uh, a relatively less sophisticated attack or even a partially successful attack can have pretty significant consequences. And in speaking of these sort of partially successful attacks, the news this week has been particularly busy with examples of OT and OT adjacent cyber attacks. We have a clipping here from, from news just this week that mentions an attack on one municipal water system and another on a port. Um, and so these types of incidents understandably cause concern for both public and private sectors. As Stephen mentioned, I've worked with the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which has reported on stakeholders' calls for greater attention and resources to building cyber resilience and critical infrastructure in particular. And the commission has offered some recommendations to tackle this challenge, including uh, defining what they call systemically important critical infrastructure and also increasing intelligence support to the private sector. So that's one thing. It'll be interesting to see how that how those um, recommendations evolve. But overall, looking at this, um, people might be surprised with the number of incidents in the OT space. We often hear about stolen data, but these sophisticated attacks, as you can see, are more complex and can't always be avoided. And we'll discuss the associated legal risks that are also very broad. And so they really the key takeaway here is there is an incredible diversity of industries that are affected by this threat. And Jason, I know you and your colleagues have been kind of centrally involved in a lot of the important incidents in this space. So I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts on incidents that you're you're particularly concerned about. Yeah, so we talk a little bit about the, the likelihood situation, and I'll expand on that a little bit uh, in a moment. But I think that also part of the things to understand from an ICS perspective is the overall impacts. I've done a lot of uh, financial modeling when it comes to what a cyber attack could look like, where we could actually evaluate what does it mean to be down for a certain amount of days or weeks or uh, even months maybe. But when we examine that compared to sort of the IT impacts, the sort of corporate network impacts that most people are more familiar with, we see it to be orders of magnitude less than what we'd expect to see in the ICS space. And that should make sense for some folks as you sort of uh, think through it. The operational space, if you are relying on industrial control systems, that is most likely how it is that you're actually making money as an organization, how you're able to process bills because you're providing a product. And if you can't provide that product anymore, well, you can't also get revenue coming in. But simultaneously, the impacts that we're now talking about aren't just going to be sort of the exfiltration of data, even if it's sensitive data like PII, it would actually be the destruction of equipment. There may be a hole in the ground now when you go and go on site to be able to do an investigation, which looks and feels obviously a lot different than what we expect to see in other sort of IT-centric incident response capabilities. And we touched on this a little bit more uh, earlier on when we talked about so the more likelihood that we see around ransomware. 
And so uh, this is actually a conversation that we have up here about NotPetya, which was not ransomware. Uh, it was actually a wiper disguised as ransomware. And if you look at all these organizations who were impacted, uh, FedEx, Merck, Maersk, Mondelez, um, all of these were not laser focused targeted. Those are what we expect to see in sort of an ICS specific attack. You need to understand so much about the engineering, so much about the systems and the protocols that it really does need to be a more focused attack for you to say, ah, they were going after the industrial control systems, the operational technology. While operations was impacted at many of these organizations, you can see here there are a couple of the headlines that sort of talk through what it looked and felt like. It was more about collateral damage than anything else. They, they were not targeted specifically. Uh, they shared a common characteristic that led to where this attack was, and they shared another common characteristic that allowed the attack to propagate, which had to do with their overall perimeter defenses and how they were using the operational technology security program that they may or may not have had in place. That allowed there to be, in the case of FedEx, conversations of $300 million or more in damages because operations was impacted because IT was impacted. It wasn't an ICS specific attack. It wasn't looking at how to break equipment, but it did lead to a halt in operations because a lot of the systems they were depending on were blasted back to the 1960s. You're now talking about people trying to go out there and buy new laptops, buy things that allow them to communicate, not just go through the overall, oh, I have a turbine that's down, I need to be able to replace it. So it was a very different type of attack but you can see that even in the case where it's just tangentially involved, where ICS and OT is tangentially impacted, we're now talking about over $10 billion in estimated damages from an overall response that's more than 65 countries uh, sort of impacted. So again, it gives you that idea of what these orders of magnitude could look like, but it also gives you an idea of a little bit of the soft L underbelly we think of with ICS protections. Because in a lot of cases, if it's not been invested in, you can find yourself having a really bad day that gets magnified even worse. And so what we have also done at Dragos, beyond talking about threats, we also talk about what it is that we see when we arrive on site. We do incident response, uh, again, specifically for industrial control systems, specifically in the OT space. And so you can see here that unfortunately we see uh, while defenders would have an advantage if they were to invest in these things, we have found that 71% of the organizations that we went to had poor security perimeters, uh, really talking on the electronic side, not just physical. Also the fact that most of them could not detect any of our red team activities if we did a penetration test or sort of a tabletop exercise, if you would an operational drill of what an attacker would look like in your system, uh, most uh, organizations would not be able to have detected those. And also seeing that um, we have, unfortunately, a lot of these control systems that are very, um, they need to be very secure. They need to be sort of our crown jewels that we protect and put a lot of investment into being directly accessible uh, from the internet. And so those are sort of uh, additional trends that we would like to be able to see improve because defenders really do have an upper hand when it comes to being able to invest in their systems and understand their systems more than an attacker would. An attacker needs to take a lot more time to understand the engineering processes involved. And so being able to sort of save the day, as it were, uh, actually would take just uh, a little bit more effort in being able to have these perimeters in place and additional technologies uh, for detection. And so um, I don't know if there's also been other things that um, you have seen, Stephen, for example, when it comes to incident response plans in this or other shared takeaways that you saw. I know when you read this, you had some additional conversations as well. Yeah, something on the legal side, I think when we talked in-house counsel, um, certainly at the beginning of, of some of our engagements, I think one theme we've heard is that in-house counsel have been told by their colleagues, um, you know, on the engineering side or, you know, the, the infrastructure um, side that, the OT systems are air gaps, or the OT systems are too old to be hacked, and therefore, essentially, there isn't, you know, cyber risk associated with those systems. And also, that I think, you know, there's sort of, um, you know, there's a, a sense that existing IR plans are adequate to handle, you know, enterprise IR plans are adequate to handle the OT issues when they arise. So I'm just curious if that, I mean, it sounds like you, you've heard the same thing, you know, or at least you've seen that there isn't air gapping. I'm just kind of wondering your perception, both about that sort of, you know, systems are too old, they're air gaps, and they're too, you know, they can't be hacked, um, and then sort of the adequacy of plans that you, you're seeing in place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, the one thing that we'll say when we, when we have a client talk about the air gap is that the air gap is usually a myth. 
Um, there may have been vendor access that was given years ago and that folks didn't even know was still there. Uh, or having additional consultants on site that were given remote access that was never taken away. Uh, there is a, an old saying that there is nothing more permanent than a temporary firewall rule. And even in the case where you do believe that there is an air gap system in place and maybe there is no communications, one of the things that I like to highlight for folks is sort of what would be the most air gap system you could even think of in the entire world. And, and then maybe the entire solar system. In this case, I would be talking about the International Space Station, which even though itself, it is air gap by, by like an atmosphere. Uh, it has actually had two cases of reported malware. Um, because at the end of the day, not only are we talking about where the communications may lie, but also could you sneaker net something in? Meaning can somebody walk in with a USB and plug into a port and next thing you know, I have sort of localized malware on those systems. So even in the case where we do have an air gap, there's still some additional protections that's taken into consideration. And obviously your incident response plan is gonna look very different than a data breach. Because again, you're now involving engineers. You're now involving people who know how that turbine operates or know uh, how it is that you'd actually be able to remove the sluice gates from the water system. All of those things require more information than what we typically see in what would be a data breach incident response plan. Great, thank you, thank you, Jason. And, and you know, as, as Veronica said earlier, I think the legal risk when we start talking about these hypotheticals, these types of attacks, um, or an actual attacks, you know, the legal risk that you know flow from those, I think, are fairly obvious. You know, if people are getting injured, um, if you're having like the the sluice gates on the dam being um, being removed, obviously, you know, the legal risks are, are pretty apparent. Um, but just to sort of highlight some of those, you know, obviously, you're going to be thinking about litigation. Um, you know, this is not a, you know, people are probably on the cyber context are probably familiar with data breach class actions. You know, we're not talking about data breach here, but you can certainly imagine if there is real injury to individuals, um, whether it's employees or whether it's, um, you know, people in the public, um, if there's going to be potentially a basis for, for, um, for tort liability. Um, you could also be having, you know, contractual uh, litigation. Um, if you're a manufacturer and you're not able to produce products, that's um, potentially a problem. Um, you know, you can end up in, in litigation um, over, uh, you know, or with, or with your vendor who provided you the equipment and have some dispute about um, whether it met the types of uh, standards you expected or agreed to in your, um, in your, in your contracts. Um, you know, so the litigation risk is something I think you're going to be thinking about um, in response to any sort of incident. Um, you know, it may not be the case that there's been a massive flood of this litigation yet, but I think anytime you have one of these incidents, as a, as a lawyer, you're going to be thinking a lot about litigation and that's going to be something Thing, that it affects how you respond or the types of guidance you give to your clients internally as you respond. And certainly, you know, there's always the possibility that there's derivative action, securities class action, whether it relates to, um, you know, the oversight of your security program, um, brought, you know, brought by a shareholder on behalf of the company, um, or about representations that were made about the, the state of the security program. Um, you know, the alleviation risks are, are, are very significant here. Um, again, a little bit like in the, you know, when we talked about more generally about the types of attacks, the the attacks may be less frequent than you know, your, your standard data breach, um, and then maybe sort of corresponding, um, you know, a lower level of litigation. Um, but the the impact of this litigation could be very very significant when it hits. Hey, Veronica, do you want to talk a little bit about the regulatory piece? Great, thanks, Stephen. And starting here with the uh, electric grid, which is commonly kind of listed as one of the most uh, significant cyber risks facing our critical infrastructure. As you can see, there's been a number of enforcement actions for SIF violations. Not all of the penalties are enormously high as the examples here, but the you know engaging with regulators on these issues is generally not a pleasant experience. And um, this kind of increased regulatory scrutiny will make this a more significant issue for legal departments. Once businesses start having conversations with regulators, this puts pressure on prior decisions, processes, and incidents that occurred in the past. So, you know, these are often things businesses work on as they're developing through a cyber maturity curve, but it's difficult to answer questions about prior practices in the context of this regulatory scrutiny. So for regulated industries, we often say that the risk of a regulatory inquiry is one of the strongest rationales for early engagement of the legal team in cyber incidents. Um, we're happy to talk offline about any of these various uh, regulatory regimes that we'll cover briefly in these slides. Um, but the key takeaway is that this regulatory scrutiny appears unlikely to diminish in the near term. 
and regulators are also expecting companies to have policies and incident response plans in place. So Jason, um, particularly on this one, with your experience in this space in both the government and the private sector, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts or predictions on the regulatory focus on cyber, um, particularly concerning this kind of expanding reporting requirement. Absolutely, and you can actually see right here, I think one of the, the highlights being uh, sort of the FERC moving to a new version of the SIP standards that now also asks for sort of a, a level of rigor on what you're reporting. Uh, these reports were uh, typically seen before regulation as voluntary and sort of uh, best in class, whatever we can do to share information across the industry. And then it's slowly now gotten to the point where there's additional rigor as to what needs to be reported. It's now also being reported beyond uh, just to the regulator, but to DHS as well, to be able to start looking across sectors for potential uh, additional information and other incidents. So we're gonna start seeing that a lot more. Uh, even the body of NERC itself uh, it was sort of a response to first the 1965 blackout when it became a voluntary body, and then the 2003 blackout when it became a mandatory body. And so you're always going to see sort of regulation respond to incidents that we see uh, as asset owners. And I expect that you'll obviously see more incidents and therefore possibly more regulation as a result of that. Thanks, Jason. And as we'll highlight briefly over the next few slides, although the regulatory frameworks are different, Regulators are moving toward uh, moving away from basic compliance to actually expecting companies to have effective incident response plans um, in place and procedures that align. Um, and this pressure is also uh, coming from a, a broad range of policymakers to increase the scrutiny. So just last week, the uh, Government Accountability Office issued a report um, saying that additional action is needed to enhance DHS's oversight of cybersecurity at high-risk chemical facilities, which is another indication of this. Um, regulatory scrutiny increasing over time. Uh, similarly, along the lines of the same theme here, we're not going to dive into the, the details of each system, um, but you can see that regulatory expectations for documented, risk-based incident response plans are increasing. With this in mind, um, it's important to think about documenting uh, your plans and training associated with them, and to expect questions on how well you executed against those plans. So um, in our experience, regulators typically focus on both the preparation for the response and whether the response is effective. So although you can't reduce your risk to zero, if you have attended to that regulatory compliance, including around your incident response preparedness, you'll generally be more likely to be able to answer those uh, regulators' questions when an incident does occur. And we've been talking today about incidents largely from the perspective of owners and operators of OT, um, but it does merit mention that companies that make the effective technologies often are called upon to assist their customers with underlying vulnerabilities in the effective products. So in other words, um, you know, the, the company that runs the, the technology may be running its incident response plan, but its vendor may be called upon to run its vulnerability management process. And that could take on a couple of flavors. One, if it's a zero day, a vulnerability that hasn't previously been identified, um, the vendor could effectively be validating, coming up with a patch, you know, pushing out the patch for this vulnerability as quickly as possible. Or if it's a, 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 a vulnerability that's previously been identified, previously been disclosed and remediated, or at least a patch has been issued to the public, um, the vendor may be assisting the, um, the, the affected cu customer um, in you know, basically getting that patch installed in a way that makes sense. But I mean, maybe Jason, if you have, a, a, you have some thoughts on this, I'd be curious about your sense of the relationship between vulnerability management and incident response in the, in, in the OT context. Well, yeah, thank you, Stephen. When we typically talk about this, we, we think of it um, where the incident itself would be the, the big boom, the boom that happens. We have left of boom and right of boom. Uh, right of boom would be everything that you respond to. You're, you're now on the other side of the timeline. So you're all of a sudden uh, activating your incident response plans. You're going to restore and recover as best as you can. But left of boom is sort of the preparation activities, the things that can actually make it so that you're not responding to that bad day. And vulnerability management is a huge part of that. It may not necessarily be uh, patches by themselves. You could find, for example, that there are vulnerabilities uh, that are within products, but then you can uh, have a mitigation plan in place. And maybe that mitigation plan is monitoring, or maybe it is removing communications where you do not need them. Uh, all of those sort of pieces go into how an organization, an asset owner themselves, would work with their vendor in sort of a side-by-side -side partnership to manage that risk. 
Uh, this leads to a lot of the conversations that we're now seeing in many industries about supply chain risk. Uh, what is it you do with your vendors and how does it you procure both assets and services? And looping that into your overall sort of risk management approach, how does it I evaluate these impacts and respond accordingly, is really critical to be able to make sure that the bad day that you may happen isn't as bad as it could be by managing that problem sort of up front. And on that theme, um, Jason, I think, you know, we'll talk next about the responding effectively to cyber incidents. And the whole point here is how do we, from a legal perspective, how do we respond in a way that reduces legal risk? I mean, certainly from a technical perspective, there's a similar analysis, but we're particularly focused lawyers, particularly focused on that legal piece. Um, and, you know, we, we've talked a lot so far about how responding to OT incidents and how OT technology is different from responding to data breaches or, or IT technology. But I don't want to oversell that point. I mean, my at a very when you when you go up to a high level um, from a legal perspective, while the elements um, or sort of the, the 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 specifics um, will differ from IT to OT, the basic elements and the things that a lawyer is going to be thinking about and the things that a lawyer is going to want to check um, are happening within the organization are essentially the same. So, you know, you're going to want to understand the roles and responsibilities of the various team members in a new response. You're obviously going to make sure that the right members of the team are involved in the response. You want to make sure there's coordination, that there are good judgments being made by appropriate stakeholders, um, and there's appropriate escalation. You want to make sure you've got the appropriate third party resources in place, and you want to make sure that you've got, um, you know, a coordinated approach. So this is you know, the stakeholders, the plans, and the resources may be different from the IT context, but this is not a problem that, um, that a lawyer will not be familiar with the, the basic structure of how, how to address. You know, this is probably the same type of, if you had a chemical spill that wasn't in any way related to cybersecurity you pro and you had a crisis, you'd be bringing a lot of the same skills to bear and the same thinking to bear from a legal perspective. So I don't want to pretend that there's anything magical about this, um, you know, just because it's a cybersecurity you know, key that's completely unique. Um, but there are certainly some, um, you know, so, so good practices generally can apply in this context, um, although there are certainly some, some details. Um, maybe on that, on, on that front, in terms of some of the, the specific details that will be different, um, because I do think certainly if, as a lawyer, if you've gone through a data breach and you've helped manage that process effectively, you may be surprised about some of the bumps you hit in the road uh, on a responding to an OT breach, so a, a specific to OT. Um, so I'd be curious, Jason, maybe if you could just, you know, give us a little bit of context here um, for the, the differences in delivering an effective technical response for an OT incident versus, you know, delivering an effective IT response, you know, for, for us as a traditional data breach. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that you see when you talk through sort of that traditional data breach is most folks have got the indicators that show them a data breach has occurred. Uh, maybe there was something that was seen across their uh, security incident event monitoring solution. Uh, maybe they had been able to uh, analyze sort of exfiltrated data and be able to respond to that. As I mentioned earlier, though, for OT, it may look and feel at first like a maintenance event. And so it, it takes a lot more sort of coordination with what could be a cultural rift between where you see your IT security professionals and your engineers sit. Now, engineers and operators are not necessarily always trained, although they should be, as I'm about to make the case for, on what to do or what it looks like to go through a cybersecurity incident from that OT operational perspective. They may see, again, a loss of comms and think that it's a uh, sort of uh, failure in the overall equipment, not that something malicious is happening. There are a couple of outliers, obviously. One of the things that you could read on, for example, is the Ukraine outages that happened uh, in 2015, where an operator actually was seen and watching the mouse move across their screen and start opening up switches, which led to an outage across three utilities impacting a quarter of a million people. But that's not always going to be the case. Again, it will look and feel more like a maintenance event. And so what I encourage folks to do is actually draw upon the sort of uh, silo of excellence you already have for disaster recovery and those maintenance events, but make sure that they have the hooks and the communication to be able to talk cybersecurity. That is most likely where the gap is going to be. Most engineers will be able to talk through how they respond to a disaster, whether it be man-made or natural, and they've been exercised on that. But they may not have been exercised as to what that would look like if it started from a cybersecurity capability, which is where sort of this uh, sharing of information and this overlap between IT security, corporate security, and OT uh, would actually take place. 
And that's one of the things that we see is, is not necessarily a technology gap, although uh, not detecting in your OT problems is, is the number one technology we don't see in there. But it is also a cultural gap that we see where folks don't engage the engineers on what that cybersecurity response would look like. And as you can see from the, this diagram here, there's a broad range of stakeholders that contribute to effective uh, incident response in the OT space. I won't go into too much detail because Jason and Stephen have already really talked about the key issue, which is that um, the it's unlikely to be the same team that you would see in a data breach context that you would see in an OT breach context. So you might see the CISO lead an IT incident response and they might have a much smaller role uh, for OT, for example. And obviously different companies have different setups, but what's um, often unique about OT is that um, there may be owners of specific elements of infrastructure and regional offices without a common leadership, and that can make um, getting a common set of stakeholders more complex. And so obviously depending on the dynamics, it may make sense to incorporate different people within the business, but um, within this broad range of stakeholders. This can make legal's role more challenging, as I'm sure you can imagine, because you want to still make sure you're in the loop and able to identify and address legal risks within this framework. And just uh, one note on the ex uh, external forensic teams. Normally, um, for instance, we try to engage them through legal counsel for privilege, but they can be valuable um, for both particularized expertise, but also a level of separation and validation when you're providing statements to uh, third parties, such as law enforcement or regulators. And particularly, we think it's valuable in the OT context to get external forensic teams uh, pre-positioned so that because of the more limited set of providers and the potential complexity of, accept of accessing affected components. So just uh, on that point, uh, Jason, um, in practice, which groups uh, within you know, this circle does Drago's, the Drago's team typically uh, interface with when you're responding to an incident? It's interesting. Uh, almost all of them, uh, because again, the, the ICS space is a little bit interesting uh, and, and different in the fact that uh, if you look at sort of the concentric circles of who can do incident response and then who can do incident response within industrial control systems or who can do incident response in industrial control systems who also understand SIP regulation, the circle gets smaller and smaller. Um, and what we find ourselves doing a lot of the time is working directly with the client, but then also needing to uh, interact directly with the vendor as to uh, maybe a specific vulnerability that was discovered, which would also potentially loop in uh, DHS. It, so there's a lot of um, additional conversations that need to take place that actually need to be looped into what your incident response plan may look like. Um, how are these communications going to be managed? Uh, again, the overall conversation, I thought it was really interesting, you also mentioned forensics firms. Uh, those forensics conversations even could be very, very different because in the IT space, we may have a good capability to get data and be able to analyze that data for forensics purposes. But in the OT space, if it's not been prepped and planned for, uh, the number one thing you're going to be working towards is safety and reliability. And data preservation, while very important and arguably one of the most important things that allow you to be able to identify the root cause, you may not be able to always get the perfect data because you're trying to, again, go back towards safety and you may lose safety in operations if you go and do sort of IT-centric tools to get forensics data. So having firms that understand that uh, does require, again, smaller concentric circles, but it means that there's a lot more communication with vendors and government than you would typically expect to see in a normal incident response on the IT side. Right. Thank you. And so in terms of the, the, the role of legal counsel, um, at the outset and throughout an OT incident, legal counsel will be assessing the possible legal obligations that we've, we've touched on that may arise out of the incident. And here we just highlighted a few of the common issues that generally are considered. So obviously notification requirements may apply to regulators or um, non-regulatory agencies as an option. And in practice, the challenge here is figuring out how to sequence them, balancing, you know, wanting to be transparent and collaborative with regulators with that desire to understand the facts on the ground, you know, especially facing these challenges that Jason has flagged that because of the technology, you may not have all the facts that you would want before you would ordinarily uh, speak with a regulator. Contractual rights can be also an issue, whether it's about fulfilling contractual obligations or um, understanding if it's an incident of supplier. Um, understanding your contract can be helpful. They may, it may specify, you know, if you identify a vulnerability, uh, the, co the contract will 
specify whether that supplier has an obligation to assist you in remediating. Um, but in practice, the main, main takeaway here is that it's important to tailor the analysis to the specific compliance considerations facing the company. So, um, and what's unique about OT is that sometimes the incident can spill over to other systems and raise questions in a broad range of, of regimes. So, uh, you know, if you're making a chemical compound and there's a concern about the machines, you may also have a regulatory issue that's separate from the cyber issue about the safety of the product that you're making. And uh, this ties well to the point that Jason was making about the difficulty sometimes of preserving, uh, gathering facts and preserving evidence. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, compared to, you know, standard data breach where role of counsel is well established, often people think that the role of counsel in an OT incident feels um, not as well established. But from our perspective, it's really the same logic that applies. So. Um, you want to mitigate the most significant legal risks while also recognizing that the forensic team has to be able to get their work done um, without undue interference from legal. And so um, these are kind of some of the key issues that, as with any incident, you want to make sure that you're gathering facts, preserving evidence, maintaining privilege, and just each of these has its unique challenges in the context of OT. For the sake of time, we won't dive into these, but happy to speak to them, to them afterwards. Um, and just one thing we'll note for privilege, going back to the fact that there's a large group, it can be really helpful to establish those clear expectations with the team early on in an incident. And we've seen a lot of companies in other spaces have started to do training with the incident response team on the importance of legal risk and privilege. And that's something we haven't seen as much in the OT context, but um, we think that that is something worth, worth considering. Um, so just uh, Jason on this, it would be interesting to hear your experience with working with legal teams and what you have found works effectively in the OT space? I think you hit it right on the head. It's really something you want to plan for. So just making sure, just as you do in the IT space, it may be additional parties. So now you're bringing in some engineers, uh, but even from the Dragos perspective, having sort of retainers set up in front of in front of an incident to also be able to understand your systems a little bit better and also understand the people they may be working with during an incident goes a long way to be able to sort of cut down on that mitigation time when that bad day it does happen. Thanks, Jason. And I'm just going to touch on the next few slides really quickly as we're coming up on the bottom of the hour. But I do want to highlight that you know, talking talking about information flow um, and the information to collect, obviously escalation of information within the organization, even up to the board of directors, is, can be a big issue. One thing we've seen is that with all the different groups playing a role, um, it's possible that different levels, different executives at different levels get different information at different times, which can lead to a lot of um, tension within a company. Um, and, um, you know, particularly if there's a big decision to be made about whether to how to contain an incident by shutting down a facility or what have you. Um, you know, so thinking through how the information is going to flow upwards um, is it, certainly an important uh, thing for legal to be thinking about, um, not strictly a legal issue, but there are legal ramifications if it doesn't work well. In the same way, um, communicating with third parties in the media, this is an issue that um, the legal will be involved with potentially through retaining a communications firm under privilege. Um, you know, obviously accuracy is very important in any public statements. Um, there are lots of different stakeholders you'll be, um, you know, you'll be engaging with. So consistency across those statements. Um, why you're thinking about the particular ramifications of talking with, you know, whether it's a regulator or law enforcement or, or the press directly, as well as insurers. And I know, Jason, you've thought a lot about insurance. Um, you know, anything you'd add of particular thoughts about how insurance works in the OT context? Just making sure that there is some sort of sort of tailored coverage, right? A lot of the things that we see come out of insurance, unfortunately, are uh, that OT was never considered. So they may have a very strong cyber insurance policy, but it doesn't actually cover any damages from property and casualty, which is what we'd expect to see in OT. The other things that we typically see uh, from that cyber insurance perspective are triggers that have to deal with exfiltration of data, which is what you expect to see in a data breach. Uh, but exfiltration of data may not be something that happens during an OT incident. You actually just may see commands get executed, which leads to those property damages. And when you find yourself not having sort of a uh, policy tailored to your situation and your possible impacts, that's where we see mismatches and people try to use a general liability policy to respond, which we know is really going to be like a Hail Mary path at that point. Uh, so uh, that, that's some of the things that we see is not having that tailored response for your insurance portfolio. Right. And we just have a couple of minutes left. So I want to talk a little bit about 
preparation. Um, you know, I think that's been sort of inherent in everything we've been talking about today. So the idea that, you know, obviously you have a lot of things you can plan to do, the more you, you get that work done in advance, the better you're going to be able to respond effectively. And I'll say that, you know, we have in the four minutes left, we may not get to be able to get to the questions that have been submitted, but we'll follow up by email to any questions um, that are left for us. Um, with the, um, you know, the, the preparation in our mind sort of boils down to sort of two basic categories. There's sort of the assets and resources to put in place, the policy and procedures, tools, um, you know, logging capabilities or what have you. Um, you know, a lot of that is both is, is sort of administrative and technical controls. Um, and there's also tabletops, um, so doing the training, the actual sort of human preparedness. Um, you know, having a, a well-tailored tabletop, as Veronica mentioned a number of times, like, you know, really focusing on tailoring um, your work um, to and your preparation to the, the risks that you face. Um, and maybe, Jason, I know you've, you've got, done a lot of sort of work around breach coaching. Um, you know, I think we've, we've seen that, you know, th th that kind of work can be really, really effective. And um, we just have a couple of minutes left, but is, are there any particular thoughts you'd leave people with around how to prepare most effectively to respond to these incidents when they do occur? Yeah, really the, the two that you've highlighted, uh, focusing a lot on that training element, the people element. Uh, cybersecurity is not just about the technologies. That said, if it's one of the technologies that uh, we should see more of in the OT space would be OT-based detection. Because if you're not looking for something, then when it does happen, you won't know it until it's too late. So really training your people and having detection technologies in OT are really sort of the crown jewels of what you want to focus on. Maybe I think we have time for one question. Um, you know, I think there was a question early on um, we, when we were talking about the complexity of different attacks, um, and you know, we were saying that the, you know, fortunately, some of the most complicated attacks that have achieved the full attack ICS attack chain is very, very complicated. And it's not an easy thing to do. Um, there was a question that came in: is like, well, what about ransomware? That sort of, you know, may not be quite as complex. How? Um, how would you describe, um, uh, you know, how would you answer that question? Like is ransomware, is it complex attack, is it not a complex attack? My sense is it's not. Um, and how does that relate to sort of that general sense that it's ICS isn't quite so much at risk of those most, most sophisticated attacks? So it's really interesting because sort of the, um, there are families of ransomware. And so there's a lot of ransomware that's just untargeted malware. Um, it could be organized crime or some other financial motivated attackers that are just trying to lock up specific uh, devices at first, then maybe systems, network connectivity. And that network connectivity could be the thing that actually impacts your operations as a collateral damage piece. If you can't communicate, then all of a sudden you may have uh, operational problems, but it's not focusing specifically on the turbine or the motor or the generator. It's focusing on locking down the network. And you can actually build in uh, sort of additional protections around that on how it is that you'd manage comms during those that could help you recover and respond more effectively. So it, it really does focus again on uh, sort of the uh, different families of, of ransomware. But by and large, when we're talking about it, we're talking more IT focused, uh, nothing that really impacts the protocols or the systems or families of OT based uh, devices. But I'll just say thank you very much. Thank you very much to Jason. Thank you very much to Veronica for participating in this. And thank you to you all for joining. Um, this has been a great session, and, and um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, it was a really important issue, and um, hopefully, uh, as you can tell, we're enthusiastic about it. We think it's really you know, an important issue for legal counsel to be thinking about. So thank you for your time. Um, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll close the session. Thank you very much.